Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Toronto Center's panel on nature-related risk, uh, macroeconomic impact, and transition planning. Since our establishment in 1998, Toronto Center has trained more than 23,000 financial supervisors from 190 jurisdictions to build more stable, resilient, and inclusive financial systems. In 2016, seven years ago, we began incorporating climate risk in our training programs, and at that time, international standard setters had not incorporated that in their agendas. But I'm very proud that today we are an implementation partner for several global bodies and standard setters, such as the NGFS, IAIS, and IOSCO. Sorry to throw alphabet soup at you, but I think this audience knows what they are. We have assembled a star panel. They include uh, Governor Stefan Ingves, Chair of Toronto Center's Board of Director, and the former governor of the Central Bank of Sweden, the Honorable John Rangambwa, Governor of National Bank of Rwanda, our friend Sabine Modere, Vice Chair of NGFS and Board Member of the Bundesbank, and Jean-Paul uh, Serres, Chair of IOSCO and Head of Belgian Financial Services and Market Authority. We're also tapping our good friend Jean Pez of World Bank to moderate this conversation. He did such a great job last time. Jean, you're back. You've seen their impressive bios, so we won't read them. Toronto Centre's mission is sponsored by our key funders, Global Affairs Canada, Swedish CEDA, the IMF, and other valuable partners such as Jersey Overseas Aid and UNCDF, and on and on. At this time, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Canada's new Minister of International Development, the Honourable Ahmed Hussein, who has graciously agree to uh, provide brief opening remarks. Before I cede the mic to him, I want to say a few words without reading the bio. He has um, made a name for himself in Canada as an accomplished lawyer, community organizer, and a staunch advocate for social justice, diversity, and inclusion. Mr. Minister Hossein has served in the Canadian Ministry of Prime Minister Trudeau since 2017 in three different portfolios, and in July became the Minister of International Development. And we cannot be more excited working with him. He and I have a few things in common. One is that we both live in Toronto when we are in places like Marrakesh. The other is that um, we both fled the violence of our countries of birth. Each of us sent as a teenager without parents to North America, Canada, and uh, I don't know that either of us, uh, Minister, could have imagined that we would find ourselves at a World Bank IMF annual meeting working on behalf of Canadians to help uh, lift people in developing nations out of poverty, working to uphold democracy and human rights. Minister Hussein, it's my pleasure to give the podium to you. Thank you, Babak, uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, it is a pleasure to join all of you here uh, today as friends and as partners, uh, because everyone in this room understands the instability that currently plagues the world, and you understand the importance of responding uh, to the pandemic, to the after effects of the pandemic, to the uh, destabilization caused by Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine, and by the increasing frequency and intensity of climate disasters. We know that countries will only be able to manage these uh, challenges if their financial systems are also sound, stable, and inclusive. That's what you work on. And since 1998, the Toronto Centre has built a solid international reputation in supporting uh, countries to do exactly that. Let me congratulate you on your 25th anniversary this year a key milestone to celebrate your important work. You have made significant contributions to financial stability by training over 23,000 supervisors and regulators in 190 countries. This is really important work, and uh, all of us in this room are very appreciative of everything that you do. And I, I, I remember, Babak, when, when I first met you, I was working in uh, a subnational government, a province in Canada called Ontario. And one of the files that, uh, that I was working on was, uh, was regulatory reform. 
uh, for, uh, for, for, for uh, regulators in Canada. And when I look at the work of the Toronto Centre, it's clear that we have a shared vision to create a more inclusive world, a sustainable world, a prosperous world, a secure world for everyone. A world where everyone has access to a decent job that helps make their lives and their communities better. And one that includes the meaningful participation of the most marginalized people, especially women and girls. And this ties very well with Canada's feminist international assistance policy. Because at its core, our international assistance policy is about gender equality. It's about the empowerment of women and girls. And that is why financial systems that include women leaders, ones that make finance accessible to women, entrepreneurs, are critical to the success of those economies. And uh, one of the key things that we all know is that when you empower women, you reduce and tackle poverty. And the Toronto Centre has led the way in integrating uh, issues like gender equality and climate risks into your work. You have found innovative ways to deliver programs that promote sound, inclusive financial systems in emerging markets and in developing countries. For example, your leadership program for women supervisors and regulators in sub-Saharan Africa. This ensures that African women leaders are prepared to take on more senior leadership roles. This is very, very important work. And that they're better equipped to promote financial resilience and a feminist economic response in their countries and regions. For example, participants have spoken about the benefits gained from something as simple as networking and how making those connections can make all the difference to their work. How they learned strategies to find their voice, how to be authentic in the boardroom and not fall into roles like making tea or taking notes. So the Toronto Centre also offers programs that support regulators and supervisors' efforts to adapt to climate change related risks. Because climate change endangers the stability of both national and global financial systems. But financial systems can also support finding solutions to address climate change challenges, both on adaptation and mitigation. This work is making a crucial difference by delivering customized programs to supervisors, regulators, and central bankers. And it reflects the local context of this work. It also ensures that global expertise is brought to bear in creating local solutions. And so as a government, as a country, we're proud, in Canada, we're proud to partner with the Toronto Centre as they contribute to building stable, reliable, and inclusive financial systems worldwide. I look forward to seeing what we can achieve together in the future. Uh, I congratulate you on your 25th anniversary this year. It's an important milestone. And I wish you a productive panel discussion this morning and I now want to turn the floor back to Babak. Thank you very much. Merci. Okay, I'm just here to tell you it's the last time you'll see me on the stage. John, over to you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Minister, for emphasizing also the importance of stable, resilient, and inclusive financial system, which are really important from a development perspective. Thank you very much to the Toronto Center for organizing this event and, and for the support from Canada. So uh, I'm not going to introduce the speakers. I think you have everybody's name. I think everybody is very well known. The bios are also available on flyers. So we can get directly into this discussion on uh, nature-related risk, macroeconomic impact, and transition planning. We we'll do two rounds of questions. Uh, each panelist would have one question, roughly four minutes to answer, and then we'd open up for question and answer uh, so that uh, the audience can participate in the discussion. So, Stefan, let me start with you um, on what is the rationale, what is the reason for central bank and supervisor to be concerned and to engage themselves as their, um, on that nature-related risk? What's the impact? So there is an element of context, what's happening, but from the fundamental mission of supervisors and central bankers, why should, we, should they look at these challenges? And how does that relate to the macro impact of nature-related risk? Well, first of all, it's a, it's a total order to solve the world's problems in, in four minutes. So everything I'm saying is going to be very telegraphic in some, in some sense. And uh, starting with a sort of a macro perspective, 
it of course differs and differs enormously from country uh, to country. And it's difficult uh, to fully understand how to translate climate issues into macroeconomic policies the way we normally talk about macroeconomic policies. But let me give it a, give it a try, a brief try. First of all, I think that we're actually moving beyond climate, and there are three, three strands. One is climate, the other one is biodiversity, and the third is population. And it will be very difficult over the coming uh, years uh, to deal with the issue of population because basically population growth is the highest where it gets the hottest. And on the other hand, population will decrease in cooler areas of the world. And that will create all sorts of macroeconomic issues, not to mention the political tensions that will come out of that. And that is uh, difficult to deal with. The other aspect of this is the time frame. And I spent 29 years in central banking. And basically, when you deal with monetary policy, your time frame is one quarter to the other quarter. And a maximum time frame is kind of three years. The way to think about that is to look at uh, probability distributions, fan charts, uh, thinking about inflation. But at the other end, you have identical fan charts produced by the IPCC. But their time frame is 30 years. And how do you combine three years with 30 years? That is really, really the hard part. And I don't have the answer as of yet when it comes to how to think about those things uh, within those two very, very different uh, time frames. And we simply do not, as of yet, have a framework uh, reconciling those two very, very different time frames and different ways of looking at, looking at things. But at the same time, if you think about this from a central banking uh, perspective, and you think about it from the economy, uh, from the perspective of the economy as a whole, clearly many of the measures that are needed to be taken will affect fiscal policy, they will affect tax policies, and they will affect structural change within the economy as such. And that we need to understand in a much, much better way compared to uh, the way we've been sort of thinking about it in the past, because it's clear if you're in the central banking business, you almost take for granted in a three-year perspective that the structure of the economy is constant. And that's not the way it is going to be in the, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, let's get back. So let's get Ronald and think about the country. OK. Works? OK, thank you. So uh, Governor John, Rhonda, so this is, we can see the impact of the degradation of nature. Things are being done to preserve and restore it. And these are macro potential and micro potential uh, uh, consequences. So in your country, and Rwanda has been at the forefront of the work uh, on, on climate issue, how do you look at that? What are the consequences? And what can you do as a central banker and supervisor? Maybe the Hello? Microphone. Yes, I think I'm, I'm connected. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. And let me again start by thanking the Toronto Centre for assembling us here this morning and for giving us the opportunity to discuss this uh, emerging but very important uh, topic. Uh, for the central bankers, at least in our part of the world, we are just restarting to, to focus and deal with this issue of, of climate change and, and biodiversity degradation. Talking about Rwanda, maybe uh, I would say what, what has been the cause, the main cause of uh, biodiversity degradation in Rwanda. Uh, so as the population increased, mainly uh, uh, relying on agriculture, a lot of land was cleared for agricultural purposes. So forest, natural forests were lost. That was one of the biggest challenges we had before. Then again, in terms of settlement, uh, at the beginning, settlement was done haphazardly, and uh, factories, homes, we end up in wetlands, and that affected the, the, the ecosystem and the, uh, the, the natural flow of water and uh, other ecosystem uh, uh, matters. Then. The use of, apart from clearing uh, uh, forests for agriculture, but we still have maybe about 80% of our population relying on wood or charcoal. And that also creates uh, pressure on, on forests. And uh, uh, 
then as, as the, the world evolved, the use of uh, plastic materials that are not uh, and undegradable, so that, that, that created really pressures on, on the, on the, on the uh, natural ecosystem. So, and these have ended up in disasters within our country, mainly uh, uh, soil erosion and, and uh, flooding, uh, but also which is the other that is really attributed to the global warming in general is uh, uh, short and very uh, uh, heavy rains that really causes, uh, causes uh, uh, flooding, but also uh, long uh, dry spells that has greatly affected agriculture. And that, in a way, affects livelihood in terms of, uh, as you're talking out to the central bank, the biggest challenge we face through these uh, climate change issues is uh, on inflation. I think uh, Stefan has just uh, touched on that. As a country that is uh, still uh, agrarian, 27% of our economy uh, uh, is agriculture, and uh, about 57% of our population employed in agriculture, and uh, agriculture food contributing to about 28% of our uh, inflation basket. So that's erosion of, uh, of, uh, of land and uh, prolonged dry spells has affected agriculture. For example, in the last uh, say five years, 18 to 2021, our agriculture was growing around 4%. But in the last two years, we've had very poor performance of agriculture growing at negative uh, 2%. So that has affected the lives of the population. That has affected inflation. Food inflation went up to uh, around 52% uh, end of last year. It's today uh, about 28% uh, uh, or still very high. High and a challenge to us as the monetary authority, but more so a challenge to livelihoods of our population, to people's lives. It has also impacted on our balance of payment because as we we have poor uh, domestic food production. Our import bill has increased because we have to import more food. And that uh, has impact on the overall uh, uh, exchange market. Our, our, our depreciation levels for our, our flour and their domestic currency has gone to double digits that we haven't experienced for more than 10 years. Uh, this year, we expect it to be above 15%. Now, all this comes back to the question you asked me about the impact on the, on the financial system. Good enough, we haven't had a big impact on the financial system, though at the macro level, because of this high inflation and because of the challenges with exchange rate, that is impacting on the, uh, on the assets of the financial institutions. But in terms of the credit risk, it's been mitigated because the actions taken by government uh, one, to, to, to uh, I said the causes of degradation, but the government had to come in strongly, as you said. Uh, so th th there's been relocating people and factories and all installations within the wetlands, and that had a big impact, of course, on, on people's assets, but government had to take the heat uh, by, by res uh, uh, compensating the lost assets and allowing especially the, the the business establishments to, to, to relocate. But there's also been a lot of relocation of our populations. Our country is a, a, a mountainous country. So government has to resettle people in risk areas, high areas, because of the landslides and all that. Uh, so all that has, unfortunately, the, the impact again, maybe at macro level, it diverts resources from investment into poverty reduction uh, uh, initiatives to dealing with climate-related issues. And so, uh, but I, I would say from a point of view as the regulator for the financial sector, we haven't had any big impact uh, on, on, the, on the macro. Small, small uh, challenges on, on, on a few uh, borrowers, but generally speaking, the financial system remains uh, stable for now, apart from the bigger macro challenges on inflation and, and exchange rate movements. Thank you very much, Governor. So, Sabine, let me turn to you and go back to the global discussion. So, the uh, NGFS, the Network for Greening the Financial Sector, first has grown a lot um, with a much more diverse representation than it had at the start. 
including more emerging market, but also is looking at the climate issue include, and nature. So there's been quite a bit of work uh, on nature-related financial risk, including the recent publication of a conceptual framework for assessing those risks and to guide the actions of central bank and supervisor. So could you walk us through a little bit what NGFS is doing, what's the logic of the approach, and what are the next steps? And now uh, you plan also to engage regulators, supervisor, and central bank on these issues going mm -hmm. forward. Yeah, sure. Um, maybe before I start to go into the technical details, um, I think that the major question we first of all have to clarify, why should we now also take a look at or even care about nature? Um, that's what I usually hear, because usually, you know, even in the central bank world, people say, well, we do already deal with climate. Um, so why should we now once again deal with something where we initially thought this is not our mandate? So now we have another subject, uh, nature. So I think that still many needs to understand, need to understand why this is important, that, that it is something different uh, than looking at climate. Uh, of course, no, um, the governor just mentioned that um, droughts, floods, or whatever we happen with due to climate change has an impact also on the environment, uh, especially um, um, uh, water is missing and water is a cap nature capital that really matters. But let me just have a look uh, together with you in what actually do we understand under nature? So what is nature asset? What is nature capital? And why is it so important to take care of those? It is because nature, different kind of nature assets, serve our society, be it food, be it pharmaceutical product, be it whatever we need. This is mostly based on either plants or um, um, the, the, uh, the wildlife or animals. So and just to give you an example, um, besides water. Just take the US uh, pharmacy, pharmacy industry. 30% of all pharmaceuticals sold in the US are based either on plants or on animals. And then, yeah, just tells you story. And in addition to that, if you look at the um, worldwide, at the WWF study that tells us that nearly 70% of the wildlife has dropped from 1970. So what does tell us this? You have 70% less wildlife, and you have 30% only in, in the uh, pharmaceutical project in the US based on that. If you cancer, anti-cancer drugs, vaccination, and so on, um, is depending on plants and on animals. So just to give you an idea, how even if you do not get emotional about nature, right? You are all economists, you most probably do not get emotional. But if it comes to the figures, I think it really matters. So what do we uh, do at the NGFS? At the NGFS, we did a first step, we just published a framework to get a little bit of a common understanding what actually is the meaning of nature assets. What is a nature asset? Which kind of categories do we have? Water, soil, uh, forest, um, so, so a lot of different capital assets uh, or nature assets. So then to, to have clear what do we mean by nature-related risk? What is actually a risk when we talk about nature, right? So that was the first step. The second step, and as you may uh, notice, it is, it is not as easy <laughs> to understand like, like climate. In climate, we have one metric. It's the carbon emission. Mm -hmm. We just, just have to take care of the carbon emission. And we, we know how we could do that. We just are not capable of implementing those tools, right? When we talk about nature, it's much more difficult yeah. because we have water or we have the soil or we have the forest or we have whatsoever, the animals, all of them their drop and their extination is triggered by completely different sources or reasons. So what we now do at the NGFS is we start with case studies. So we will pick one nature asset, be it, I think we did, have not decided so far, let me take soil. What does soil really mean for our economies? 
Second, what do insects really mean for our economies? And how much value is their service to our economies? So that's important for us in the next step to understand. And when, once we've understood that, we mil, will make, um, then have a look at, so this is the macro, that might be the macroeconomic impact, nature assets and the threat to nature is it has, and what does that mean for our financial system? Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabine, and very clear explanations. Thank you for walking us through. Uh, what, what NGFS is doing and why it's doing it. So, uh, Jean-Paul, we always discuss the role of the banks in this discussion. You're coming Both. with a very different angle, which is the role of the capital market and securities. So, IOSCO, which you represent, um, has been one of the first global standard setter to endorse the new uh, sustainability board standard, disclosure standard. So, what do you think are the role? What is the role? Why is IOSCO looking at this? Why these are these disclosure standards so important, and, and they are also um, their implementation will be will be critical, and both the pluses, but also the potential risks. What is at stake into that discussion on disclosure and rolling out what has just been approved? Well, thank you for your very useful uh, question, Jean. Allow me first of all to say two things. First of all, to congratulate Babak and his uh, colleagues for their birthday. Congratulations. You deserve it, and I think it's important that I'm telling that in my capacity as IOSCO chair, because as you know, Babak, Toronto Centre is an important stakeholder for IOSCO. We are managing many work streams together, and recently, my colleague from Spain, Rodrigo Bonaventura, who is chairing an important STF IOSCO system task force, had the pleasure to be interviewed by Toronto Centre. Second thing, thanks for you very objective statement, more than I would be as IOSCO as the chair. Yes, indeed, we are the first one to endorse ISSB standards. Maybe better that you are telling them that I... But more seriously, I would say, uh, if I want to, to answer your question, I need to give, in fact, in a nutshell, in four minutes, less than four minutes, uh, I would say, answer to three questions. Why IOSCO? Hmm? How? How are we working on this? Okay, and when? That's about the time. Why IOSCO? Quite surprising, ladies and gentlemen. I think that many people know me and that I am a doer. Uh, I am pushing the agenda uh, of IOSCO uh, every day in my life, but I don't belong to the group of people who would say IOSCO need to be there every year for everything. There are many national initiatives, many regional, but here we are speaking about climate change. And the starting point of this fascinating, positive journey doesn't happen frequently for people like me that we have such a positive journey. Most of the time, starting point is rather negative, a crisis, how to learn from a crisis. Here, the positive day journey, ladies and gentlemen, are in fact in the room. It's you. Maybe you are a private investor. Maybe you would like to understand in which product of companies you would like to invest and that they are in line with your expectation about ESG. You are not interested at all in working with, I would say, an alphabet soap of different private or public standards at national level. No, you would like to have one toolkit. So the challenge is global. The message must be global. Now, let us be clear. But John and Mary in the street would like to know which kind of toolkit they could use, but very rapidly. They are not waiting for us for a while. That's the reason why IOSCO must be there. IOSCO, I'm not sure that everybody knows what it means. 130 jurisdiction, global membership organization, uh, or, or members, national members are involved in the supervision of 95% of the whole financial sector all around the world. So we have the capacity to manage this from a global point of view. The majority of our jurisdiction are coming for growth and emerging uh, market, which is also very important when you speak about sustainable finance. Then, how are we working? I think that everybody agrees by the fact by saying that the financial sector, if the financial sector would like to have an added value for, in order to fight against climate change, it's not about technical aspect. The expectation about the financial sector is to be helpful for channeling savings to targets which are for financing targets which are in line with ESG expectation. Therefore, we need a language. And the story for that is not an old story. Everything started, I would say, less than three years ago in Glasgow, Finance Day, 4th of November, two important uh, news, GFANS, initiative of uh, um, uh, McCartney, and the launch of ISSB. After two years, we are very far, let us be clear. Can you imagine that in two years' time, a new body was created, 
at global level. They were able to appoint a board, which really it's a, a good translation of diversity, not only about gender, not only about geography, but about background. Then they drafted a standard, the draft prototype. They, they were able to find a Belgium compromise about multi-location, and it works. And then we tried to challenge. First of all, we had to convince the IFRS Foundation three years ago to work on it. And I can understand that there was some pushback from IFRS Foundation because it's about no resources. We were able to convince. And then when I had the pleasure to be elected less than one year ago in Sharm el-Sheikh, the COP27, I told to the agents, more or less like this, today, OK, we will be back at the end of 2024 for the filing of the financial statement with a fully-fledged comprehensive tool. Not sure that many people believe me, but we are there. We were able to endorse in July with a lot of, I would say, press coverage, maybe because many journalists were surprised that we were so fast. Speed is important, but it doesn't mean that we drop all the constraint about, I would say, due, make, due, due process and decision-making process. During for more than one year, we challenge. We require from IFRS Foundation the change from standard about proportionality, scalability, inclusion. What, what, do we do, what do we do with the SMEs? What do we do with level three? What do we mean with safe harbor? Everything is there. We endorse that in July. And the objective, and that will be also explained in Dubai, with the support of the IFRS Foundation, in order to help, we are a global membership organization. We must be helpful for all the NCA in order to have sufficient training, sufficient capacity building, and that's the reason why IOSCO was the first indeed to approve the standards. Thank you, Jean-Paul, very clear. You mentioned a very important point, which is the mobilization of private capital to support all these efforts, be it on climate, on nature going forward. So let's turn to the second round of question on transition planning and disclosure, because part of it is how to provide explicit strategies so that the financial sector intermediates the saving, but also supports that transition to net zero as the next step um, for climate as well as nature. So Stefan, turning back to you again, and there's a lot of discussion on transition planning. It's also uh, lots of things happening, so it's sometimes a bit difficult to find one way on this. So what do you think are the role, is the role of the central bankers and financial supervisor in supporting that transition and providing guidance, in, uh, starting with the banks, on transition finance, what does that mean, both in the context of advanced economy but also emerging market? Well, first of all, <coughs> And the institution where I used to work has been around since 1668. And from day one, it was understood that the central bank, that's where the money is. And that has, since 1668, and also so in the future, created tensions. And that brings us to really to the issue of what is the mandate. And uh, in the early days, and, and Sabine has also sort of referred to that, it was very easy to say, this is completely outside our mandate. We will have nothing to do with it. We will continue doing what we have always been doing as if nothing has happened. This is somebody else's business. But to your first question that I tried to answer about the macroeconomic consequences, it's obvious that there will be macroeconomic consequences. And that means that it sort of feeds back into your mandate anyway, like it or not. So. It's probably suicidal over time to say we ignore this completely because economies and the world, the glo global economy, will be affected. So you need to think about and you need to understand these things, but in many instances, actually within your mandate. And I think that that is also what is expected of you, regardless of where you're talking about supervision or monetary, uh, monetary policy, because you cannot anymore say this is somebody else's business. So you need to internalize these things and think hard about how to deal with them, but within your mandate. And this, of course, differs enormously uh, from country to, uh, to country. <clears throat> in some parts of the world, central banks, supervisors are very independent. And that means that they have to be careful when it comes to how they deal with this within their mandate so that they don't stray outside their mandate because that is going to backfire. Then in a number of other jurisdictions and countries, there isn't really much of a mandate uh, because basically the central bank supervisory agency is kind of part of the government in one way or the other. And then it gets more difficult. And back to my reference to 1668, then people understand that that's where the money is. And let's use some of this money for all sorts of purposes. And that 
then it gets very, very difficult and one has to be careful about the governance structure that you use. And uh, one has to be careful not to stray too far because if you spend too much money on whatever it is, that's going to produce too much inflation and macroeconomic imbalances in one form or the other. So one has to be careful on that side. I referred earlier to, to the time frame. When it comes to monetary policy, most central banks pr produce monetary policy reports, let's say six to eight times a year. When it comes to financial stability, financial stability reports are being published once or twice a year. And then given the time frame when it comes to climate, if you produce a climate report at all, let's say once a year, once every two, three years, something like, like that. And it's quite a challenge actually to combine these, uh, combine these things uh, and in order to produce outputs that others can understand. And when they read these things, they can say to themselves, aha, this is what the central bankers and the supervisors are doing uh, within, this, uh, within this field. And that's a challenge. And let me, let me explain. Suppose we are not successful. So global warming is more than one and a half degrees Celsius. Well, then of course, you will have very serious consequences in many different parts of the world. And that will affect how you think about these things, how you actually conduct supervision, how you understand what is going to happen, what happens to the banks, will they make credit losses? How do they uh, adjust to these things? Do we or don't we create a functioning uh, market for, uh, for, for bonds dealing with climate change? On the other hand, let's assume for the sake of the argument that we're highly successful. So we're gonna stay below 1.5 degrees. But to get to that point, that probably requires massive investment in transition technologies in one way or the other. And that is also likely to affect the banks and the security markets. And then we need to understand all of that. Then we need to understand how to deal with sectors of the economy that simply have to cease to exist as the way as we know them uh, today. And we have to under better understand what it implies when it comes to what the banks are doing, what others are doing, where the investments are, investments are uh, uh, going and how to deal with that. And that will be quite a challenge, actually, to better, better understand that. And particularly, if you look at the numbers today and look at, let's say, there are various reports from different parts of the world. I sp speak about these things from a European perspective. There aren't really any major catastrophic issues in the extreme short run. But certainly things will change in the long run. And how do we, uh, how do we deal, with, uh, deal with that? Uh, since I, when it comes to reports, I do think it would be a good thing if the IMF and the World Bank jointly produced, let's say, once every two years or something like that, a kind of a joint report on the economic consequences of, now, of, of what is going on uh, presently. Because you're the only ones who have the capacity to do, the, to do that at the global level. Uh, you will have many, many reports at the national level, but that's a different, uh, different things. And then we'll take it from there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, and indeed, um, I mean, we have quite a bit of report on, on climate change, the CCDR, which are the main tool of the bank. At the moment, to analyze that at the uh, national level, if I'm mistaken, there was recently one for Rwanda, actually. Uh, so, Governor, let's go back to Rwanda. So, you, the country has placed climate change, sustainability of the economy at the forefront of the national strategy that is likely to have implication on the financial system. There is also, in the case of emerging market, that whole discussion between mitigation, resilience, and adaptation, which brings sometimes different elements from what we see in advanced economies. So what is the National Bank of Rwanda doing? As you mentioned earlier, inflation, there is an impact from a financial sector perspective, maybe not now. So how are you also reconciling these different time frames? Yeah, th th thank you. Uh, I think, uh you talk of time frames, we are in challenging times with a lot of emerging issues. I think Stefan stressed the point of uh, central banks sticking to their mandates. Unfortunately, the, the challenges we live in today keep on stretching and uh, uh, 
challenging us to look at other factors that will challenge our mandates. <coughs> and uh, uh, just want to stress uh, again the point uh, Tyson by Stefan on the independence of central banks. Uh, happy that our central bank has, uh, is independent and with key, uh, two key man oh, the key mandate is financial stability and uh, uh, price stability. But talking about the relationship or what we do to support the shift within the financial sector in line with the challenges we are facing of climate change, we see it from two angles. One is at the primary mandate of the Central Bank of Financial Stability. How do we uh, ensure that the challenges or the risks associated with the uh, climate change doesn't destabilize financial the financial system. So that is from the financial stability point of view. But also, we talk of uh, shifting from uh, brown financing or encouraging financial institutions to support green uh, projects for sustainability purposes. So do we have a role to play as central banks to, to encourage uh, or to support green financing by our financial systems? Uh, so that, that's, as I said earlier, we're we really taking on uh, uh, a lot of initiatives today as, as the National Bank of Rwanda, but working with our colleagues within the government and other development partners to see how we can position uh, ourselves as a country to, to, to align with the key uh, orientation of the government having uh, environment and uh, sustainability are the key ingredient of our development uh, programs. So one, we've worked with our colleagues to, 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 to define a national green taxonomy that is really at the beginning of uh, any uh, uh, serious or sensible channeling of resources to, to green projects or to sustainable projects. So we are finalizing this at least to support uh, the financial institutions to understand what would they, if they, deal with this project, how does it fit into the, the green economy part of, of that. Uh, then, as I said, we are just beginning. We ourselves, the financial institutions, there's a lot that we have to learn on, on uh, what it means to, uh, to promote uh, uh, green financing, so or what are the risks associated with climate change, and which we have the fiscal risk, we have the, 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 the transitional risk and the rest, which channels are most likely going to hit us as a financial system? What are the challenges linked to this? How do we deal with that? Uh, so we are working with the financial institutions to, to, to really uh, understand this. Thanks to Toronto Center. Toronto Center has been our key partner in training our own teams uh, in understanding uh, risk associated financial institutions, financial sector in general, but now specifically on climate change risk, we, we've really had sessions with both on the banking side and on the insurance side. We happen to be the regulator of the, of the insurance sector as well. So we, again, we worked with other partners to come up with the, uh, the sustainable finance roadmap that, that redefines really what we are going to do as key players within the Rwandan uh, market and we, as as a central bank, among the, the 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 eight key strategic pillars of this roadmap, we we are going to be contributing to five of them, and we've identified this. We uh, uh, now we, we we are looking at ourselves. We, we've just done a, again an assessment of us as as a central bank. How are we ready to deal or to play a part in in uh, one safeguarding our institutions against risk linked to climate change, but also supporting uh, sustainable financing. Uh, and with that analysis, uh, analytical work, then we are coming up with our own action plan. We've just introduced, uh, call it sustainable finance center, of a sustainable finance unit within the central bank to lead the initiatives and guide us on what we need to do uh, as, as a central bank. Uh, again, we understand that we there's a lot of uh, new things and challenging, so we, we are out to work with the uh, partners globally, and I'm happy to be sitting with the chair of the NGFS on this uh, panel. So we, 
We joined NGFS last year, and we appreciate being part of this uh, uh, central bank family that is uh, trying to, 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 to work together to support each other on how we deal with these uh, challenges we are facing. Uh, so I, I think briefly that's what I can say what we are trying to do. Uh, but of course, one key factor that I should have said uh, now in relation to the, to the financial uh, stability mandate is we, we, by the end of this month, will be issuing guidelines to the financial sector on what we expect, how we expect them to position themselves to deal with the, with the challenges of uh, uh, climate risks, whether in terms of governance, in terms of their strategic planning, in terms of their risk management, and then on the disclosure. So this, we were issuing the guidelines this, uh, by the end of this month. But we've also just incorporated climate risk as part of our risk profile that we track as a central bank. So uh, plus also introducing, uh, do I call it climate risk or environmental friendly practices in our procurement uh, in a procurement uh, uh, policy, so you, yeah, as we uh, put out uh, 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 offers, like for example, currently we, we've uh, put out an offer to print our currency and environmental matters part of what we consider for the for the competitors of this uh, of this uh, 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 offer. So. Briefly, that's what I can say. I think, as I said, there's a lot. It's, it's really a new area that we are all uh, entering into. But I'm happy that we have partners. Uh, I said NDFS. We're working with this, uh, the World Bank itself. You, you just mentioned that. IFC, uh, Agence Francaise de Développement, has been a key partner in, in this. So we, we, we are really working with different partners to, to try and understand better how we can play our role as a central bank but how we can also support our financial institution in this transition uh, period you're in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Governor. So Sabine, NGFS work on this was mentioned several times. Uh, so we see now an increasing number of countries making net zero commitment, but also companies, banks, and, and other financial market players, investors. So, and that was a big topic of discussion also at the last NGFS plenary, uh, the role of transition finance, transition plan. So what's the NGFS approach? What potential do you see there? But also challenges and the importance of peer learning on also on how this is done. Yeah, so maybe before I start with alluding to, to this particular question is, why is it important to have transition plans? Um, First of all, I think you mentioned just Glasgow and all the pledges we receive from banks, from companies, from, from governance and so on. And two years later, we see pledges are easy to do. Implementation is another story. So I think, therefore, it is extremely important um, that we need to have some proof that what is in a strategy, that those pledges are really uh, um, get implemented. A second point, why transition, why we really have to care about transition, not, not only greening, is um, three years ago even, we talked only about how do we mobilize money for green projects, projects right? It's just about uh, green as of today. And now we understood that, especially in the global north, but uh, I would say globally, it is it's really important that we move the existing economies through this whole journey to net zero. And this is, I think, even more challenging than mobilizing money for, um, for, for green projects. So having said that, um, it is extremely important for the companies or financial institutions themselves to have a strategy how do I get there? You know, I have a mission right now as of my work. So what is my next step within the next five years? How do I look like in 10 years time or even 15? So this, I think, has two advantages. The first advantage is that the company himself, be it a real economy or a financial institution, is forced to have its own strategy in place how they're going to get there and what they need to change and how it affects their business model. And the second uh, advantage for having its tr uh, transition plans in place is that now investors get an idea of 
how serious is this company when it talks about transformation? Are there figures, facts that really show they have an idea, they have a plan actually for the next 5, 10 and 15 years? So that's the reason why we at the NGFS uh, think this is a really important tool. So let's quickly, what do we do to support this, this development of having more transitions plans? We did a stock taking and we found out, so amongst our members, um, that there is a broad you know, confusion about what our transition plans are. So we got answers like transition plans about is this, so transitioning, transition, all those vocabularies, completely different understandings. Then we found out that there are some first standards when it comes to transition plans, but usually it's unclear what actually do we expect companies to report, and what are the standards we can check against, and who really takes care of what companies are writing? You know, who has, has a look at it and, and uh, makes sure that this is, has some substance at all? So the next step, what we will do is we will send out within hopefully the next weeks to um, financial institutions a survey and asking them, the financial institutions, what you banks, what do you really need um, what kind of data and information do you need for prepare your own transition plans? And what information and um, data do you need from your clients or from the real economy um, in order to maybe have an understanding of their transition plans? So that's what we intend to do. Thank you very much, Sabine. So you mentioned investors, they play a very important role on that, that natural transition to Jean-Paul, so what is IOSCO doing on transition financing, transition plans? What's your unique role? And what do you see emerging as opportunity and challenge in, in your membership? Well, I think that uh, uh, it's working. Maybe take the macro. Yeah. I think, uh, Jean, the best answer to your question is to say, first thing first, I would say. Um, we believe, I would say, in the added value of realistic transition plan. But if you want to have, I would say, if you want to ensure uh, that it works, it means that the financial sector uh, must have access to reliable, forward-looking information. It seems to be very easy to do, absolutely not. We all know what it means, forward-looking information, especially when we uh, link that with uh, materiality from a financial point of view and about the quality of uh, uh, financial disclosure. So it means that if we want to be successful, it means that the financial sector must have access to reliability forward-looking information from the real economy and the purpose is to allocate capital effectively. But I would say for this, the starting point is first thing first. First, we had to have the capacity to speak the same language. That will be the case with the use of ISSB standards as endorsed by ISSB and then the support of the G20, the FSB. So it means, I'm not sure that everybody knows that in the room, it means that according to our own expectation computation, in the future, in some years, more than 130,000 companies will use the same language. 130,000 companies. CSRD in Europe, with or without the SMEs, that's a, a debate at political level for the moment, I would say in Europe it means already 45,000. Uh, so in Belgium it means, for instance, 10 times more than the companies using for the time being the uh, well-known accounting standards, which are applied for more than 20 years. Uh, you have to stop? No? <laughs> so. Uh, but uh, what does it mean? We have the capacity to uh, use, to speak the same language. Then it has to be implemented. Thanks to the, uh, the IOSCO endorsement, it means that jurisdiction know if the capacity to adopt, to apply, or to be informed by SSB standards. Before the end of the year, we will have a fully fledged toolkit related to the use of audit standards. If we want to avoid uh, greenwashing, we need to have technical 
I would say, an ethical standard on board. That will be the case. We are challenging the work produced by the two SSB working under the umbrella of the PIOB. Okay? Then what does it mean? We have a toolkit for financial reporting standards. We have a toolkit for audit standards. No, we have to implement that. Okay? We will be there. So it means that we have the capacity to use more and more data. It means that what uh, the TCFD, GFENCE, is working with the project CDSC, we will have database. And what does it mean? A virtuous circle. The day that we will have more data, it means more capacity to make progress about scope three with safe harbor, I would say, during the transition phase. And the day that we have that, of course, that's the best starting point for transition plan. We have also already decided to launch, I would say, our work teams. But again, the debate is to avoid, and I speak under the control of the leadership of Sabine, one of the best spokeswomen about transition uh, planning, but I think, correct me, the idea is to avoid fragmentation. There are a lot of excellent initiatives. Uh, for instance, Monday, announcement by the UK transition plus for some of them. The same in Singapore, the same in the US, uh, which is, uh, I think, a, a very useful paper published by the US Treasury of voluntary principle re highlighting emerging best practice. The same, of course, in Europe with the famous, the acronym is incredible, huh? the CSDD, huh? which will be an, an update of the CSRD. The question at the end of the day is, of course, to avoid fragmentation. And that's the reason why IOSCO will also be on board. We have already set up our work team and we are working already with, uh, I would say, a different uh, network because our main objective when we speak about transition plan, it's about investor and, of course, how to avoid greenwashing. And the best way to avoid greenwashing is to avoid to use different toolkit. And that's the reason why we will develop good practice with regard to transition plan if we consider the risk sufficiently important, because let us be clear, I would say greenwashing is the main negative objective for us. Because if the trust disappears from our citizen, from investor, that will be a real, real challenge for everything. Because you know, I presume that you have some children, most of them, when you discuss about climate change, they say greenwashing, greenwashing. Also my own kids. I have to explain what we are doing. No, it's very easy to say greenwashing, we don't believe in nothing. No, we are doers. We try with a building mode approach, first of all, to have a common language. That's the case with the USSB standard. We implement it. We will extract more and more data. And the fact that we have more data is, by definition, the best synergy for uh, being supportive of transition plan. Thank you very much. So we, 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 it's already 11.01, so I don't know, I hope the panelists have five minutes just to open to the floor for one question. A lot of information was already shared, also a lot of information on what's happening, both the potential but also the pitfalls. So if there is one question in the audience, and then uh, we will close on that. Anyone? <coughs> yes, at the back, please. Uh, thank you, Hans Ganberg from the Asia School of Business. Um, uh, Fascinating uh, panel discussion. I have one question related to transition, and it, but it also relates to the kind of instruments that might, m one might have to use in order to deal with climate change issues. And I, I think those uh, instruments are really related to taxation, carbon taxes and other sort of things. And how, um, how is that taken into account when we ask companies to think about the transition, uh, the, their transition uh, methods if they don't know where those taxes are going to be imposed, in which countries, on what industries, on, and, and so on. And that's what uh, I find a very important and very difficult coordination mechanism between countries uh, and as well as between central banks and, and finance ministries. Sabine, you want to take this one? Yeah, I think you, you address a really important uh, topic. So what we, we just discussed about the lack of private finance. So our key uh, issue is also how can we mobilize more private investors? And the major obstacle for private investors is 
to have security. This is this insecurity. And what you address exactly is one of the biggest points of uncertainty. What will be the political and the legal framework for my future investment? So I would say that all jurisdictions who have understood that private investors need a security, a, um, a framework that you know, gives them certainty of success, at least in this regard, has clearly a competitive advantage. So I think this must be understood. Yeah, Stefan? Very quick comment. Uh, I think that in an imperfect world, don't expect first best. And you, try, you, you have to try to engineer some minor successes here and there. And then you sort of build, build, on, uh, build on that, hoping that it kind of catches on. Uh, because it's so common, if you're a good student of economics, to go for the first best. And since that's not going to happen, you say there is nothing I can do, and then you just throw up your hands, and that's not a good strategy. So you you just have to live with these imperfections, and try to improve things as you go along. Okay, so let me close here. Thank you very much uh, to John, Jean-Paul, Sabine, and, and Stefan. Thank you very much to everybody in the audience. This is clearly not a discussion that is closed. This is an ongoing <laughs> discussion. So thank you very much also for highlighting how much work is going on. Challenge of implementation, I think, was one that was really stressed across the board and that we see yeah, everywhere in the world. And thank you very much to the Toronto Center for serving also as a convening power, in addition to all the work that you're doing also already with, a, with all, a lot of countries, and that was very much recognized today. So thank you very much, everybody. Ongoing discussion, thank you. To the